Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 261 at block height 675,668 on Sunday, March 21st. So, what is up, FUD? Um, I think we're breaking a tradition here. Whoa, which one? Um, if my math is right, we, we're not taking the traditional two week break between seasons. Oh well. Darn it all. I could use a vacation though. The show must go on. Gotta pander to our audience. So yeah. Feel I feel like today today is one of those days we should just dive right into something. Yeah, I was about to say, speaking of pandering to audiences. Yeah. For us to right, right about the IRS. Just for you and me, I swapped out the order of the next two stories um, on the fly. But um, yeah, um, the IRS. Yeah. Gotta love them. So um, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then Fudd will probably come in and temper that down a little bit with some realism. But. The IRS has just announced in the last uh, couple weeks. Can't believe I didn't notice this. Like, I, I'm really amazed I did not fucking notice this. Um, Operation Hidden Treasure, a special IRS criminal investigation team um, specifically concerned with people not declaring cryptocurrency stuff on their tax returns. Yeah, and um, this is specifically being pointed out as a new prioritization for the IRS um, with people um, specifically trained in tracing cryptocurrency um, gains evasion, um, specifically looking for types of fraud like transaction structuring. Um, they specifically mention getting on and off chain um, I'm assuming that means both going in and off custodial platforms as well as non-custodial second layers, um, all specifically to hit anyone they can um, with civil or criminal charges for tax evasion or not paying your taxes, um, specifically looking to increase the application of a penalty of up to 75% of the unpaid taxes. And um, yeah, they are really looking forward um, to prioritizing this and catching the people they can. Um, and like I said, they're specifically making this a new priority. And so to get to tooting my own horn finally, like I've said for years now, in a Bitcoin world, what do you think is one of the only things tax authorities are still going to care about? That's right. Bitcoin. Yeah, chain analysis stocks go no. When I read this, I read this as the IRS marketing competency. Um, the reason you would write a lot about this and you talk a lot about this is to scare people into compliance instead of having to do actual compliance. So they're talking about how they're training troops, they're getting ready to go. And uh, I, uh, I think that's great marketing if you want to collect more taxes. And obviously, if you live in the U.S., you know that the IRS is probably your best friend, and you usually want to appease your best friend. And, like, the funniest part in this article, though, from Forbes was, uh, yeah, I think you're the one who pointed this out to me, the um, do not talk about your past 
fuck ups with your accountant because your accountant isn't a lawyer. Yeah, I thought that was fun because this piece was written by a tax lawyer and she's pointing out that tax lawyers have a special status and they cannot talk about your private details with the IRS, whereas accountants have all sorts of duties that includes representing everything they know about you to the IRS. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of the interesting things about this to me, though, is the IRS's apparent refusal um, to kind of go the route that they did with foreign bank accounts. Um, when that became a thing you had to start considering um in, in the case of that they literally gave kind of like a, a form and a pathway to kind of be like yeah i had money that i didn't tell you about because i didn't have to tell you about it back then here it is and no trouble no bullshit you just declare it and clear things up and you know they've been really hesitant to kind of offer that same kind of path for bitcoin or crypto yeah, it'll be interesting as more regs come in, their surveillance capabilities do get better, standards develop around this. I think we're only going to see more regulation in this area. Well, I mean, it's, it's just crazy to think like this, you know, this isn't going to stop. I mean, you probably are right. Um, there probably is no great competency in this team. Um, it's probably just a drop the headline and scare people so they send checks. But that doesn't mean that priority is going away. That doesn't mean that that specialization and those skills might not eventually wind up there. Because if Bitcoin keeps doing its thing, um, they're going to keep getting more and more worried about we need to pay attention to this Bitcoin thing more. Yep. Why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, yeah, this is going to be a really fun decade in the U.S. for us Americans. Super awesome. I think so. And I would remind everybody out there, if you don't sell your cryptocurrency or trade it for others, then you don't have tax liability on that good that you own. So always something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. So this fun stuff uh, done. It's even more. What, what, what's what's that guy's name? I, I the Kingpin. Kingpin made a you, you know he's a big bad guy from New York. Made that announcement about about coins and stuff. Yeah, these uh, these big guys tend to seem well fed. And uh, speaking of our well fed friends from uh, the BIS, the Central Bank of Central Banks, Mister Austin Carson's evidently did a little talk the other day talking about CBDCs from his point of view. And uh, I'm fascinated by CBDCs because CBDCs are currently all things to all people. And as long as you don't ship product, it can be all things to all people. As soon as you ship it, it has to have some characteristics. And he talks about characteristics he'd like to see in a CBDC. And uh, I'm going to quote from a video that was making the rounds on YouTube. He says, in cash, we don't know who is using a $100 bill today. The key difference with CBDC is central banks will have absolute control over the rules and regulations that determine the use of that expression of central bank liability. And we will have the technology to enforce that. I think this is pretty interesting because different people have talked about CBDCs in different ways. I think uh, Jerome Powell, current head of the US Fed, has uh, made comments that it should be closer to cash-like. Uh, but Mr. Carson's came out here and is being pretty explicit about how the use of CBDCs does not have to mirror uh, the pseudo-anonymous use of cash or the highly fungible use of cash. And, and saying right what a lot of people have placed on CBDCs, that there will be monitoring layers and there will be enforcement layers for how that type of currency ends up being used. Yep. I, I think quietly before I comment directly on this, I have to acknowledge in a moment of shame that we still need to get through that charm paper 
on his take on CBDCs. It's just there's been so much shit piling up in this space lately. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think how do you how do you expect something like what what Chalm is probably proposing, actual private cash, to ever get instituted and deployed by these people? It's just look at how they talk. Yeah, it should be noted. Um, these are not fundamental properties of CBDCs. Humans will make this decision or make these decisions as far as how anonymous or not, uh, how monitored or not, how regulated for what you can spin things on or not. Uh, these um, central bank liabilities, ACA, central bank digital dollars are. So it's up to us to digest, to tell our representatives and places, et cetera, what we would expect them to be. And it's great that we have guys like Chom out there making actual cash-like CBDC recommendations. And uh, I take the blame for not having read that paper yet. We will get to it, brave audience. Nope, that, that's both of us, because cause I, I was gonna do it too, and I didn't have the time. You know, comments like this are almost enough to make you appreciate paper money. Yeah. I mean, dude, you know, I am entirely with Janine in this boat. Um, I love cash. Like the only thing I hate about cash is inflation. It's awesome. I just put it in my pocket. I hand it to people. It's just, it, cash is one of the greatest things ever. It's my favorite thing to illustrate to people when they want to talk about somebody says something like Bitcoin is better than current money in all forms or anything up that alley. And I can take a dollar out of my pocket and hand it to somebody. And I've just given you value. If you don't have any open dimes on you, that's harder to do with Bitcoin. So there are certain values that come with the physicality of money. Mm -hmm. But it's just like, yeah, like I just, I, I don't see this going well, like, no, I don't think the public appreciates being talked to like this. And I don't think the public appreciates the concept of having broccoli bucks or money that's only good for rent or money that's only good to pay your home mortgage or what have you. Uh, one of the nice things about money is that it's fungible. And it's not just fungible in the sense that $100 bill is as good as the next. You can spend it on whatever you want. And as soon as you put artificial time-based destructive mechanisms on money uh, where if you don't spend it in a certain amount of time or you have to spend it on a certain kind of thing uh, you destroy a lot of that utility of money and certainly having a, a time destructive mechanism on money i believe would probably lead to inflation in various uh asset categories, uh, perhaps just in things that people think will hold value better. Mm -hmm. But even just the privacy aspect though, and losing that, like it, dude, this it's really weird how people have like jumped into things like cash app and PayPal and Zenmo and all this shit. And just like, they don't have a conception in their head that none of that is private. You know, it's like to, to go, an, an example I'm familiar with, like there are a, a decent amount of people who circle around like hippie communities, say, who can just blow glass. So they blow glass bowls to smoke weed out of, and they just go around and sell them just cash. Here's your, here's your weed pipe. And they make a decent amount of money off that decent amount of money in cash that no one ever knows about. And they just go spend and everything is fine. And nowadays, I know people who just do that same thing, except it's like on Cash App or Zenmo. And it's just, mm, you know, this is going to go real bad one day if the IRS sees all of this and you didn't tell them about it. Yeah, and it's just how many fucking like people make money in ways like that, where it's just there it goes, there it goes. You're in big shit now. Yeah, the nice thing is you're at least one step from the government in those cases. You're living in a private company's or you're doing business in a private company's database, which certainly the government can subpoena if they feel like it. 
Uh, but maybe that private company isn't proactive about giving everything to the government. What I would say about CBDCs is watch China. China has basically noticed that WeChat and I'm, I'm trying to remember who the other major one Alipay. by volume is. Yeah, it may be Alipay over there. Uh, you know, they have taken a whole bunch of the digital payments market. And until recently, the government was absolutely fine with that um, data trail living in their database. Well, China is kind of suggesting with the way it's going to do CBDCs. I forget the story covered previously on this topic, but they have announced that they would like to bring that back in house. They would like to run that database on behalf of WePay and, and whoever else. So just be careful what you wish for in this case, because it, it could be the U.S. steps up and says they'd like to run that database for PayPal or Venmo or somebody else. Um, just be wary about that. If China's doing it first, I, I think we probably need to think a lot before we allow that to happen in our own country. Mm -hmm. All right, on to financial systems we're building for ourselves. Woo 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 woo. So, Sherdbits has knocked it out of the park again three days ago. Um, ben Carmen and Nadav Cohen from Sherdbits made a DLC on chain futures for the Bitcoin price using multiple oracles um bitfinex shared bits um the company themselves and pierre rochard all acted as oracles for this in a two of three oracle setup um with i believe it was 128 dollars difference between the oracles prices um would allow it to validly settle non-cooperatively with the contract execution transactions and um this closed out after starting um with both parties putting fifty dollars collateral in at fifty seven um thousand five hundred dollar bitcoin price and settled at um fifty nine thousand and one dollars um with pierre rochard signing that as his closing value with bitfinex signing fifty nine thousand dollars exactly and Sherdbit signing fifty nine thousand dollars and uh, or fifty nine thousand and sixteen dollars well within the hundred and twenty eight dollar margin of error between all the oracles and successfully settled with uh, Ben Carmen making most of the money because when the Dav went short, Ben went long. So um, yeah, <laughs> the first successful multi Oracle DLC settlement on chain. Definitely cool stuff. This is going to allow you to trust less and less uh, very specific people who may have financial interests that are not aligned to yours. And I look forward to hearing about where they take this. Mm -hmm. And a nice little benefit um, they point out in, in the blog post documenting this is federating your oracles like this. It allows you to publish fraud proofs for malicious oracles while still a letter allowing you, if the rest are honest, to actually settle and get your money properly. So if you structure this in the right balance with the right number of trusted oracles, hey, if some of them decide to go crazy and ruin their reputation, you still get all your money, but you still get to ruin their reputation. The best of both worlds. Yep, yep. All right, but let's say I'm legacy and I just want to go long. Well, maybe you talk to Visa, who is... Uh, starting to make a lot of moves um they opened up the api um recently that company moon with prepaid um digital um visa cards is using they're now um explicitly setting the goal of enabling the purchase of bitcoin directly through the visa network or as they put it um enable the purchase of bitcoin on visa credentials so the way I'm reading that is directly by Bitcoin through Visa, um, as well as um, working with Bitcoin wallets 
I'm quoting exactly, to allow um, Bitcoin to be translated into a fiat currency and therefore immediately um, accepted at any of the 70 million places where Visa is accepted around the world. So, yeah. Um, in addition to the stablecoin stuff they're doing, the API they dropped this new startup Moon is using, um, it looks like they just want to keep directly tying Bitcoin deeper and deeper into the Visa network so that uh, Bitcoin can seamlessly flow through it, pop out as fiat, and vice versa. So I made this prediction a while ago that Visa will clear Bitcoin. And uh, I just keep getting vindicated. That's great. Anybody who owes me money, send it my way. I want to quote the CEO, Alfred Kelly here of Visa on this. He says, we're trying to do two things. One is to enable the purchase of Bitcoin on Visa credentials. And secondly, working with Bitcoin wallets to allow the Bitcoin to be translated into a fiat currency and therefore immediately to be able to be used at any of the 70 million places around the world where Visa is accepted. So to me, he's heard the good word of Jack Mahlers. He understands that the utility here is them acting as a payments network, which they happen to be really good at. And they're seeing an upcoming currency and integrating it. Um, it's fantastic to see this so early in the game. It's kind of funny too, to think that like this is happening 10 years after you had a community full of full idiots that are just like the blockchain itself will replace visa yeah because blockchains scale like that yep nope visa is gonna come to the blockchain guys don't worry about it and it's just like dude like the it's all these pieces coming together dude like especially the fact that visa's partnered with circle to work with them as far as USDC integration um, and compatibility with the Visa network. I mean, it, it really is. Like, they are quietly just building out the same kind of stack that Strike did. Like, you have stable coins on that network. You have direct Bitcoin interaction on that network. You've just opened up the possibility to make interactions between fiat and Bitcoin in the Visa network actually atomic in the exact same way that they are in a, in a lightning HTLC. Like it, it's, if Visa really does just become a bigger version of strike, like, holy shit. I'm going to read this other alpha Alfred Kelly quote, just because it's relevant to what you just said. We continue to think of Visa as a network of networks, blockchain networks and stable coins like USDC are just additional networks. So we think that there's a significant value that Visa can provide our clients, enabling them to access them and enabling them to spend at our merchants. They just want to hook it all up. It's, it's great. And like you say, uh, it does allow for that immediate transaction. Um, that's what Visa is good at. When you swipe that credit card, you want to know that the merchants paid. Uh, you want to know that that interaction's over. They want to know that even more so than you do. And you want to be able to go on your way. And Visa can take the risk of that not clearing or have the patience to let that clear in the background. And then everybody's happy. It's great. Or potentially in cases where people are interacting with specific systems like stable coins or Bitcoin through Visa, just instantly settle it. I mean, if, if I'm the, the whole reason for settlement delays with systems like that is chargebacks and fraud protection. Those are all aspects of purely legacy systems. So if you have Visa processing, say, a stablecoin transaction that spits out as Bitcoin on Lightning at the other end, I mean, are either ends of that transaction using anything that is capable of enforcing chargeback fraud protection? Or is that potentially a class of users specifically not caring about that so Visa themselves can just settle it and be done? Yeah, Visa brings efficiencies of scale to this market that no one else has. 
So it's great when you can buy something, say on Coinbase, and then have them transfer it to your wallet and they charge you nothing for that service. And that's because they aggregate so many transactions that go to chain every single block, they don't need to charge you anything. They're just happy to have you as a customer. Visa can offer similar economies of sale. It's gonna get weird. Spe speaking of other such things though, so uh, yeah. On the 17th, Cash App flipped on the ability for people to custodially or custodially transfer Bitcoin between Cash App users with cash tags. Um, yeah, Cash App is quite literally now a Bitcoin bank. It's, it's good stuff. Long live PayPal. I mean, if you got the database, the next step after allowing people to put entries there, I suppose, is let them give them to other people. I mean, it's like re really the only part of the stack they're missing is native lightning support. Um, you, you plug that in and again, Cash App becomes the same kind of model as Strike. <laughs> Man, seems like everybody's going to be after Mahler's playbook here any day now. Well, I mean, dude, uh, he kind of wrote the fucking playbook for if you are a custodial bitcoin service here is how you produce maximal utility um he wrote the book and it really looks like everyone's fucking reading the book now he wrote it open sourced it and it sounds like he's getting adoption but it's like you know i i really kind of want to see what the effect of this is though because i mean yeah it's it's a custodial way to send bitcoin ui um it's not as flashy as something like that with lightning plugged in not as useful but cash app already has the massive user base i'm really interested and i, I you know i'm gonna just have to look around anecdotally in my own experience here or wait for other anecdotes to pop up but you know, you, people settle bar tabs, food tabs, dinner tabs, whatever, with, with apps like this all the time. Being able to just zap Bitcoin over custodially instead of just dollars, I want to see how that goes. I want to see if removing the step where I send someone dollars to cover a bar tab and I have to harass them to go in there and hit the buy big. I can, it's just, I'm just going to send you Bitcoin. Nope. Sorry, I sent you Bitcoin. My mind went to the exact same place. Uh, much like the Visa story, it takes the friction out of sending people Bitcoin when you share that platform. So it will be really fun to see how their numbers come out for that sort of use case. I mean, I've already been offered once since that happened to get paid via Cash App for beer. <laughs> Anecdotal. There we go. Let's get some newbies with Satoshis in their hands. Agreed. All right, one more about crypto deposits, withdrawals, and just moving stuff around. Uh, this is a little bit of a dated story. Uh, I believe this news dropped in February, but another piece wrote it up uh, this month, and I don't think that we have covered it here yet. Uh, but this is about Robinhood Crypto making public comments about how they would like people to be able to take custody of cryptocurrency purchased on their platforms, which to me elevates them to the point of being an exchange. So uh, that would put them in direct competition with the likes of Coinbase, Gemini, etc. cetera. So uh, let's see. Oh, also, they've got to have one of the larger user bases for, for uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, in 2020, it's reported the monthly average of new customers trading on Robinhood crypto was approximately 200,000 people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in February, dun, 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 no, sorry, I'm losing place here in my notes. They made the comment that they wanted people to be able to self-custody these things. Uh, so this is interesting from the point of view that Robinhood is a widely used millennial brokerage platform already. I think a lot of people gained exposure to cryptocurrency once Robinhood crypto came online. Uh, sadly, you cannot 
take margin loans against your value of crypto. Robinhood, please add this. Um, but it would be great to see them step up into the full physical game. Uh, you know, PayPal has also said they would like to move into this direction. Places like Cash App, of course, already support this. Uh, I highly encourage them to look into this because I think it potentially allows them to pick up even more users. Uh, users that maybe are used to grabbing physical coin may consider their services if they step into that realm. Hell, what I'm just thinking about is all the people with paper Bitcoin exposure on Robinhood when that switch flips, hey, you can you can just become a real Bitcoin owner now. You can withdraw that. You can put it in your own. You, you don't have to sell that. You don't have to go to fucking Coinbase or Cash App. Or it's just, nope. Hey, the, the withdrawal button popped up. You can click that now. Like, that is what I am interested in here. When this flips on, how much of that Bitcoin starts flowing out of Robinhood? Yeah, and that's got to be something for them to think about. Uh, as a paper Bitcoin holder on Robinhood, I am definitely interested in this, uh, especially after price runups. And I purchased paper Bitcoin on Robinhood specifically so they could do my taxes for me. So I didn't need to account for Bitcoin that I bought specifically to sell this cycle. But as somebody who uh, got after it and now holds maybe a little more on there than I'd like to and sees other opportunities for how I might use that Bitcoin or just transfer it to something that is truly mine, I am personally interested in seeing what happens here. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like th that's just like a weird double whammy event. Not only is that something that can just rocket them up to a major broker in this space, but like, yeah, um, depending on what kind of, you know, public reaction to this, what message starts spreading around out there in reaction to this when it happens, that is a major, major potential to turn people who just have a number in a Robinhood account into actual Bitcoin holders with their Bitcoin physically secured that Robinhood can't just go, you're out. It, it truly is. And if I don't even remember what Coinbase is supposedly valued at at this point, but being able to exchange Bitcoin for dollars does a lot for your valuation multiple. So take note, Robinhood. Mm-hmm. All right. Speaking of major conglomerates that are Bitcoin interested. Yeah. So um, SBI, the major Japanese tech conglomerate um, that runs exchanges and dare I say ugh, um, a, a partnership with Ripple. Um, they also started manufacturing their own mining equipment back in 2019 with an undisclosed partner and have been self-mining that entire time um, with, I think, around two exahash or somewhere around a percent of the network hash rate. Um, well, um, they are opening up their mining pool um, to the public at request initially. Um, and this pool is specifically designed more for institutional miners and players, but they are accepting just individual operators um, with the plans to eventually down the road fully open this up to the public so anyone can just sign up and point your hash rate at them. But um, yeah, it's really, really interesting because we've, you know, we've seen a decent number of new pools pop up in the past few years, like pooling and block stream. Now um, you have the Venezuelan um, national mining pool. Um, and now you have this, this private corporate pool that was operating by itself um, opening up. And it's a, it's a really interesting thing to think about in my mind, because if you look at miners, actual hardware operators, um, that are running their own stack. They're not plugged into a pool. Um, they're using their own node, their own block generation, their own hash rate hardware. Um, they're obviously competing to make the most money they can. Well, it's kind of interesting to think that with your hash rate's profitability itself, 
you could actually potentially increase your revenue just by opening a pool, charging those pool fees, um, et cetera, et cetera, depending on how those curves worked out. And it's really got me thinking like how much more of this we might see in the next few years rather than everybody hooking up to these po old established pools that have been in the space for years. So it's just something that's kind of been tickling my brain since I saw this. Yeah, to me, this is a big centralization FUD buster in that you've got, first of all, a Japanese conglomerate. A lot of those types of conglomerates are long-term established business collections that just aren't going anywhere. And second, they have over 1% of the hash rate, which means they are significant. They will find blocks. And third, this geographically diversifies them from other um, you know, pools or mining centralization points, and they make their own hardware. This uh, does nothing but shout diversity in terms of miners and Bitcoin mining. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, two more things along that front. I guess just kind of buzz through them too quick because there isn't really that much there. But uh the Kentucky bill on tax incentive um, discounts, so the sales tax on electricity and a few other things operations we're using, as well as general data centers um, getting the same kind of breaks, has passed the Kentucky legislature and is going to the governor for final approval. So, um, yeah, if that flips on, um, the governor doesn't lose his mind and go, no. Um, Kentucky is going to be a really attractive place for Bitcoin miners and data centers in general. And um, sorry, go ahead. Definitely interested in other states' reactions to this, trying to pull miners into their own circles. I, I think this could be a great regulatory arbitrage war just getting started. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's not just going to be states either. Um, so back in episode, all right, nope, I'm sorry. Uh, Janine's way better at that. Um, my memory sucks. Um, like 10 episodes ago or around there back in January, um, a province in Pakistan, the Khyber uh, Pakhtunkhwa, probably butchered the shit out of that province, um, voted to use government money um, for mining operations. And so that has kind of solidified itself to the point where they're going to build two hydroelectric uh, powered um, mining farms as kind of a pilot program to start an initial mining operation and see how this is going. And um, quick ironic mention is this is happening as rumors once again are circulating that India is considering banning cryptocurrencies altogether. So, um, yeah, um, this is going to be interesting just to see how profitable and how much money this would bring in for a provincial government like this if such information comes out publicly. Um, but it's also going to be really interesting just to see how, how does this change India's mind? Like India's Supreme Court, bad, can't touch banks that dragged on forever and eventually kind of flipped in the other direction and now it's banned to, like not sure they're really going to follow through with that if pakistan next door um kind of takes the opposite approach it seems like setting yourself up to get screwed there yeah it's definitely interesting as soon as province level governments start seeing incomes from things like this, and I would liken it to states seeing incomes from marijuana taxes. They have a lot of incentive to stay in the game, get deeper into the game, listen to people and how they'd like to evolve that sort of thing. And once states have funds, they really don't like to get rid of those sources of funds. So that is interesting. And as you say, India doesn't like to lose Pakistan. So there could be great incentives there. Yep. And I guess last little uh, thing of note in this uh, section. Uh, after 
covering TSMC um, deciding that crypto miners have to wait for fab time. Um, Samsung is warning of chip shortages getting so bad they are considering delaying um, the release of their next model Samsung Galaxy. Um, and that's really fucking interesting to me because Samsung has a lot of fab capacity um, to the degree that not only do they sell it to a lot of other manufacturers, but to my understanding, aside from little private deals that we don't know about because somebody just makes chips, mines with chips themselves, um, they're the other big supplier of fab time for crypto miners in this space, aside from TSMC. So yeah, that that is a, a really interesting dynamic there that even with all of that fab capacity for some reason they're considering not releasing one of their own in-house products instead of cutting fab availability to other players yeah well if you got the fab you want to rent it to whoever pays the most i would guess so I'm wondering what the behind the scenes dynamic is here is definitely curious. And I didn't capture the story, but I saw one about, I believe Shenzhen, uh, the state going out and sourcing 12 inch um, silicon wafers for the manufacturers inside their state as a state service. So that makes me wonder where in the supply chain we're necessarily seeing these constraints or whether they're selling fab time that they don't want to talk about to people they don't want to talk about. Yeah, don't know. I mean, it's, it's really complicated to try to rip apart an entire global supply chain and go, where's the problems in here? <laughs> All I know is there are a lot of people out there who would like to be buying Bitcoin miners right now because I hear they're very profitable. Mm hmm. Going to be a sticky situation when that price is rocketing up and ASICs aren't getting churned out fast enough. Yeah, which is pretty much right now. Oh, boy. All right. So, this next one I found interesting, and it's going to take a little bit of setup to talk about this, but a lot of people were very interested in Beeple's NFT sale the other day, which has been reported on as the most expensive or one of the top three most expensive pieces of art ever sold, which sold for, I believe, something like $60 million of a high bid and then 9 million bucks to Christie's for even doing the deal. And now Amy Castor has thankfully weighed in on who may have purchased this NFT. Now, if you'll stick with me for just a minute to set this up, you might find it worthwhile at the end. So the buyer was uh, a pseudo anonymous account uh, referred to as Metacoven. Uh, Amy Castor has done a little digging, listened to some interviews, and it sounds like Metacoven may be a gentleman named Vignesh. Sundarasan. And uh, Vignesh has owned a few Bitcoin companies in Canada, uh, has set things up over the past 10 years or so, it kind of sound like. Uh, he owned a company called BitAccess, which was a Bitcoin ATM company, maybe is, in Canada. Uh, in Singapore, he founded a group called the Lindroid Foundation, which raised 50,000 ETH, I believe, in a token sale early on. Uh, he's founded a consulting firm called Portkey Technologies that claims to have backed several projects, including Ethereum, Polkadot, Definity, uh, Omizgo, and Decentraland. And then he also launched a crypto exchange in Ontario called CoinZ in 2013. Okay, Lindroid is an Ethereum-based platform for swapping ERC-20 tokens. And Metacoven is behind a Singapore-based company called Metapurse, which is a crypto-based investment firm. Uh, their mission, according to website, is democratize access and ownership to artwork. 
Uh, the firm has been acquiring NFTs. It purchased a Beeple called Everyday's 20 Collection artwork for $2.2 million in December. Okay, there's your background. Now, Metapurse is also behind a token called B20. B20 is a token that uh, is I, I'm just going to read the quote uh, from them on this. We believe we truly achieved this with B20, the name of a massive NFT bundle we are fractionalizing so that everyone can have ownership over the first large scale public art project within the metaverse. It is important to note that we're fractionalizing ownership, not the assets themselves. These fractions will be available as 10 million B20 tokens and can be referred to as keys to this digital vault. So I love B20's tagline here. Uh, it's own the metaverse renaissance. Very good, very good. Okay, the ownership on this B20 token is currently 59% by MetaCoven, the host, 16% is publicly held. And then what caught my eye was that Beeple owns 2% of the Medicovan token. So Beeple's artwork just got sold to a company that he owns a fractional percent of, which is fascinating. With all the talk about money laundering and NFTs, I just thought that that was really fun. Um, and that you've already had somebody figure out that they can make a pool. Uh, and I checked on coin market cap before the show, this B20 token is currently worth around $113 million. So artists selling art to themselves or to a pool where they stand a profit off of it. Kind of interesting. So Somebody bought their own artwork, fractionalized it to do another ICO scam with money that came from who knows where. Hmm. Yeah, kind of sounds like a gaslight to me. Yeah. Just throwing that out there. Very interesting story. I encourage everybody to go read it. It's going to be really fun in a couple years when we start finding out who just laundered like money from Ponzi schemes and scams and fucking ETH giveaway bullshit like that into NFTs thinking brilliant. And then what's that? No, the IRS, the government, the sec. Yes. They'll show up in a few years. Um, if you still haven't learned that it takes them a few years to get around to stuff, going to have a bad time in this space. Yeah, that said, anybody who happens to have bought this token, which evidently went public for 36 cents a token, uh, topped out around $23 and is now trading at 11.22 when I checked. You know, I don't know, you might want to get out before the market cap on that thing comes down to the cost of the people. Don't know. Not financial advice. Fun times. All right. Speaking of large players in the crypto space. Yeah. So Morgan Stanley will let you put your money into Bitcoin with Morgan Stanley, but only, only, only through funds. Only through funds. Galaxy Digital, NYD Dig. And um, you kind of have to have at least $5 million. I'm sorry. If you don't have $5 million, Morgan Stanley says, no, you, you can't handle the risk of this. Like it's, it's too risky. Stay away. Stay away. You, you don't have enough money now to, to risk something that could make you a lot of money. I'm sorry, guys. This is only for the wealthy people who can afford to take the risk. I'm, I'm just sorry. We're, we're, we're just looking out for your best interest as Morgan Stanley, your financial advisors. Thank you for protecting me, Morgan Stanley. Oh yeah, and you can only invest up to 2.5% of your total net worth at the bank, it seems. For your own good, okay, dude, we're, we're just looking out for your own interest, okay? If you're not super rich, then it's just too risky for you, dude. I'm sorry. Thanks, mom. Yeah. And yeah, so, 
Imagine paying whatever the transaction fees are going to look like to do this through Morgan Stanley. That makes me cringe. Yeah. Well, the good thing is sailors out there telling people to go direct. But it is great to see these big banks come to the table and start offering this to their wealthiest of clients. Uh, it leads to different perceptions amongst the class of people that have that much money at the bank. Mm -hmm. Funny thing, though, really funny. Um, so th this is based on a uh, translated Korean article that uh, Joseph Young pointed out from Naver News. And um, this is reportedly, it's just a rumor, but... I will say, um, regarding news coming out of Korea, Joseph Young has most of the time been pretty on point. But um, with all the protections for the Morgan Stanley clients, they're reportedly um, trying to buy BitThumb, um, South Korea's biggest exchange, for a $2 billion valuation. And now, I mean, absolutely nothing offensive here, but... The reality is that exchange and a lot of the exchanges in Korea is just degenerate retail, full retard gambling. So Morgan Stanley wants to protect you from yourself, but they have no qualms whatsoever about buying the biggest exchange in a country whose crypto users um, are to a very large degree just degenerate gamblers. Yeah. It's interesting to me that they hopped offshore because probably what they're trying to buy is, is core competence around exchange type activities. And, you know, it's been predicted that a number of big players will try to buy their way into this space at some point. Um, maybe there aren't affordable properties for them to buy that are U.S. native. I'm not sure. I mean, that could be a big part of it, but I think another part also is that traditionally um, Korea and Japan are so thoroughly regulated that like there's not many gotchas that could come out of nowhere or left field. So like a, a company like Morgan Stanley buying an exchange in one of those jurisdictions, there is just so much less regulatory uncertainty for them to worry about. Sounds plausible. Yeah, just it's it's fucking hilarious to me the way that they're like the direct Morgan Stanley product is just like nope, nope, sorry, no risk taking, no degeneracy. You gotta have enough money, and then they're trying to buy a degenerate gambling platform halfway around the world that is the exact opposite of everything they just said. Well, banks are great at diversifying, so maybe they're just being culturally sensitive. <laughs> love it all right so i guess second to last thing for the day um graham ivan clark uh the supposed mastermind behind the twitter hack last year has uh pled guilty in a plea deal for a three-year prison sentence um Reminder, he was 17 when this happened, um, but is now 18. Um, and it looks pretty much like the whole reason he took this plea deal was um, if he didn't, he could have been charged as an adult instead of a youthful offender, which would have come with a 10-year minimum prison sentence. Um, so, yeah, um, can't imagine I, I would have done anything different in that situation. But um, it comes with a uh, lot of conditions typical in this situation, such as give us all the passwords to any internet accounts you have anywhere, and you are now banned from touching a computer without direct law enforcement supervision. Um, but yeah, I still have to point out here that um, I still have not seen in any document out of this court or this case that directly identifies Graham Ivan Clark as the pseudonym Kirk that actually in all the available digital logs coordinated all of this. 
And I still haven't seen a real explanation for why um, this teen from Tampa was in the initial indictment um, put down, I think, somewhere near the Rocky Mountains in Colorado as his point of arrest. And it's just, yeah, um, there's still a few things about this that just seem off. Yep, I'm still happy that those guys use their root access to Twitter to try to scam themselves Bitcoin instead of start a war. I still think that is great. That's how that ended up playing out. Yep. And there's a lot of lessons uh, from this. Um, you know, one, think about what kind of account information has been lost in database leaks regarding you because that was a factor in all of these guys getting caught um when you touch custodial services in the crypto space think about what ties to that you're leaving on chain because that's a big part of what got them caught and the last thing um when you acquire illicit bitcoin and then go mix them you're not supposed to take all the mixed outputs and combine them again right after mixing. That's a big part about what got him caught. So just if if you're out there and you're thinking about doing illegal things like this, first, just, just don't. But if you want to keep being an idiot, think about all three of those things. Because all three of those things came together in this idiot's case and completely fucked him and landed him in jail. Yeah, it's still interesting to me that somebody would have the skills to get the access that he got, but then not have the skills to handle the Bitcoin afterwards. Well, I mean, magic internet money is hard. True that. All right, speaking of making plea bargains. Yeah, so... This is an interesting thing. So Coinbase has agreed as of last this last Friday to pay $6.5 million um, settling a case with the CFTC about um, misleading volume data that it published. And so... This is entirely related to the spot market. So it's kind of a debatable thing whether the CFTC has um, the authority to do this. I mean, technically, in, in a lot of cases, in a lot of ways, they do. But um, a CFTC commissioner, Don Stump, um, in the settlement, um, pretty much voiced the opinion that despite what Coinbase did here being bad behavior, um, it is her view that it was an authority overreach by the agency because it is strictly related to spot markets and no futures markets or products whatsoever. But let's just dive into the shit. Um, so, um, Pretty much um, the CFTC is alleging that Coinbase themselves were wash trading um, to provide volume on Coinbase Pro, formerly known as GDEX, um, in order to pump volume for the Litecoin Bitcoin pair um, during a six week period when it first launched on Coinbase in 2016. And this same um, document also specifically accuses a Coinbase employee of wash trading the Litecoin Bitcoin pair um, during that six week period, um, where it fluctuated between being a few percent to 90 plus percent percent of the trading on the pair was wash trading now i don't want to specifically point fingers here but 
I cannot come up with a another employee that might be willing to do that besides Charlie Lee, who would have the money to do that and constitute at times 90% of the trading volume being wash trades. So, yeah, um, this does not look good at all. Yeah, that would be an interesting name if that happened to be the employee in question. I mean, all I'm going to say is that he was personally instrumental in even getting it listed on Coinbase in the first place. Very interesting. Yeah, how much of the float did he even own at that point? Wouldn't even know where to guess. Yeah, let's call it non-zero. But, yeah. um, This seems like the type of thing you'd want to get out of the way before you go public. So uh, a $6 million slap on the wrist, pretty cheap to get your multi-billion dollar corporation out the door. Yeah, but it's I'm more just like, like I said, I don't want to point fingers based purely on speculation but like just the circumstantial alignment of all that is just kind of like that's really fucking shady yeah if it did happen to be him and they didn't name him in this that's interesting to me too considering the litecoin was his baby yeah but yeah i guess that uh that wraps it up for the day. Yeah, so final thoughts. You got any of those? Uh, yeah, just quick and sweet. Um, it is really absurd at this point how people are unable to have impartial technical conversations without resorting to tribal memeing. Um, yeah, everybody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, it's been disconcerting to me for a while, the company alignment in this space uh, when ultimately people are after feature set. So be careful about aligning yourself with somebody's branding, somebody's services, as opposed to what you get out of them. Uh, If you stay in the branding mindset, you may exclude good opportunities for yourself when what you really wanted was the service at the end of the day. And also may inadvertently just continue spreading very poor, inaccurate understanding of things that kind of just sets the whole space back. Yep. We got to have some kind of forums to talk about the technical issues in this space that are just about the technical issues. Mm -hmm. for me uh sniffing twitter this week i smell those fud levels rising there's a lot of different points of light on this one but smelling the serious fud out there so uh keep your eyes on the prize people don't let people scare you with their fud and I swear to God, next week we will finish that Chalm paper so that we can actually talk about um, a potentially not shit idea for a CBDC architecture. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Alrighty. I guess that is a wrap for the day. Catch you later, punks. Take it easy, people. <laughs> Therefore, was there that sang it just once, right? Yeah, you can't have